Coming up on DTNS, what Netflix's reorg means to you, Apple and Foxconn might be in a spat, and the lowdown on why Twitter, Facebook, and Google are talking to Congress about Section 230. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 28th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Wednesday, Scott Johnson. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just talking about the old times, the good times, the things you forget, like the savings and loan scandal on Good Day Internet. If you want <laughs> that and a wider conversation, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Microsoft's first fiscal quarter of 2021 beat expectations with revenue up 12%, and all three of Microsoft's operating groups seen year-over-year -year growth. Azure saw a 48% revenue increase. Xbox content and services revenue increased 30%. Gaming revenue as a whole increased 22%. Windows OEM revenue was down 5%, but Windows commercial revenue increased 13%. CEO Satya Nadella said on the company earnings call that Microsoft Teams now has more than 150 million daily active users, which is up 53% from April. Windows Central sources say Microsoft is readying a big Windows 10 update for 2021. That's usually the thing. We get a small one and then a big one. Uh, this expected big one would redesign the Start menu, Action Center, and File Explorer, among other things. The UI project is codenamed Sun Valley and expected to be included in the upcoming Windows 10 Cobalt release scheduled for holiday 2021. Amazon launched a dedicated portal for Sweden at Amazon.se. The local storefront will launch with 150 million plus products in 30 categories and will provide free delivery on eligible orders above 229 kroner, which is about $26 US, and are fulfilled by Amazon. This is Amazon's 17th local portal. And uh, while TikTok waits for its court cases to wind its way through the courts, it announced it will expand some resources in its in-app election guide in the United States, adding direct access to polling locations and hours, guides meant to help people having voting difficulties, other details, how the voting process works. TikTok is working with the Associated Press to offer an interactive map on Election Day in the United States as well, showing live results for both federal and state elections, as well as ballot initiatives. All right, let's talk about Netflix. Netflix has reorganized its content division, and you may think, does that impact me? That's just internal politics, right? Well, Daily Tech News show talked Meryl Barr into writing up an explanation of what it means and how it will affect us. Uh, this as, came as a result of me texting with Meryl last night uh, where he was explaining all this. I was like, can you write this up for us? And he very nicely did. The short version is that Netflix used to be organized in a really odd way. Uh, it would be organized by genre and then budget and then territory. And you'd have executives in charge of these little tiny silos. Uh, so Barr wrote in, in his article for us, one exec would handle high budget dramas while another handled low budget sci-fi and fantasy. And another took charge of Canadian imports while another managed the Irish mysteries. And they all competed with each other. Now, under this new organization, the division will be a more traditional one with an executive in charge of drama. All drama, no matter the budget or whether it's Irish or whatever. An executive in charge of comedy, an executive in charge of unscripted, etc., with all the territories and the budgets mixed together. Barr suggests this might lead to Netflix making more traditional television rather than what he calls expensive 10-hour movies. So if you're looking at Netflix and, and you often think like, gosh, that's got a lot of high production value, but those episodes were long and it didn't really feel like a series and and it's it's kind of fitting into a weird genre. I'm not sure I get it. Uh, if you like that, bad news, they might be changing that. If you don't, more traditional formats may be coming out of this. I, I, yeah. I kind of like this and I don't like this. Scott, I don't know how you feel, but Netflix is only one of some streaming services that I sometimes just peruse and just find a weird series and just give it a go. And with good or bad results, but... I kind of like that randomness. I, I do too. I, I love I the too. fact that, yeah, like someone was like, oh, I'm in charge of the Irish mystery section, <laughs> you know? And 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 it getting a little bit more mainstream, especially because Netflix has a lot more competition than it did just a few years ago. That does make sense for the company, but I wonder if it it kind of, I don't know, it, it 
we we get a little SOL on on the consumer side if if we like a little bit of randomness. Yeah, I I don't know what this will mean. I'm a little worried about the same thing. In fact, I, what you said is exactly how I feel. Uh, some of my favorite things I've discovered on Netflix, not necessarily stuff that was pushed to me or that was promoted well, but things that I just sort of discovered. Uh, Dairy Girls is a good example of a comedy I just ah, found. Never heard of it before. Loved yeah. it. Loved every second of it. I feel like I don't maybe get that without this more fractured, competitive uh, Although executive Although Dairy Girls is an acquisition, not right. an original. That's true. The originals have been suffering a lot of cancellations, a lot of people going, right, yeah, I right. tried it, but it wasn't that great. Uh, yeah. I think that may be what yeah. they're trying to address here. Maybe well, maybe that's yeah. it. Yeah. It's, the original stuff is competing with the stuff they're importing, which is maybe that's bad. But I for me it's been good. I like the weird stuff out of nowhere that I didn't know I wanted. And I hope I they just too. don't lose that. You know? you know, it's funny. I was talking to a friend recently because, you know, we're in spooky season, right? Mm -hmm. Uh that's what we all quite call scary. it now, <laughs> I guess. And, you know, it's you know, a lot of horror horror movie stuff. And that's not really my jam. But I can see a company like Netflix using that kind of like, we need some just very obvious buckets. And so everybody who's been doing this kind of esoteric stuff, like we're all just going to, you know, let's let's get a little bit more cut and dry because the new people who sign on aren't maybe like Scott and me looking for that rando series that no one's ever heard of. Yeah. Well, uh, if you want some more details about this, kind of a new thing for us to, to hire folks to, to write for the site and give you a little more information, go check it out, dailytechnewsshow.com. The information sources say that Foxconn has been telling Apple that it hired more workers for project than it actually has using Apple-owned factory equipment to make products for rivals and cutting corners on component and product testing. Some of the more than two dozen sources also say that Apple has increased monitoring of Foxconn employees and equipment as a result of this. The sources say that since Tim Cook took over at Apple, it's put pressure on Foxconn to reduce costs to Apple. This pressure on Foxconn's margin is thought to be the reason for the corner cutting. Foxconn has tried selling equipment for manufacturing and component testing to other manufacturers to a little success, reportedly. It also developed its own polish for iPhone screens rather than buying it from a Japanese company. And... In a specific example of co corner cutting, Foxconn allegedly decided not to disassemble rejected iPhone 7s, but instead opened them, removed the debris, and then resealed them to avoid wasting materials. Apple wasn't informed of this deviation from protocol. Yeah, uh, this is a well-sourced thing. They've got a couple dozen sources. Uh, it is yeah. the information. They have a fairly good track record. And it does seem to imply that... Apple and Foxconn have, have been a little bit at loggerheads, that that relationship is on the rocks. Apple, under Tim Cook, who was their supply chain master for many years before he came became CEO, really pressing the margins, which is causing Foxconn, you know, under that pressure to cut some corners. And then when Apple finds out about it, uh, they don't release the pressure. They just put in more audits and, and more checks. And... Uh, if you go further into this article, seems like they may be diversifying their supply chain, partly because it's just a good idea to diversify your supply chain, as we've all recently learned, but also yeah. uh, because because of this issue uh, and because if they go with a Wistron or somebody else uh, to make certain things, uh, they they may find it easier, at least in the early going when they're trying to please Apple. Back when I worked full time for a company, we dealt with um, companies in China all the time and the margins are ridiculously thin just from the get-go, even in a small company environment. It was always tooth and nail to try to cut costs but also keep quality up. And I think this just feels like that but writ large. Like yeah. it's, it's a scalable problem where if you are constantly pushing for lower margins, you do get to a threshold where the factory maybe just has to cut corners and hope that no one knows. I guess I guess what I'm saying is I'm I'm not super surprised by this, but it also represents a lot of time. iPhone seven S's, that's an old phone at this point. And uh Tim Cook's been in there some since what, twenty eleven? Mm -hmm. Almost ten years. So that's a lot of time to cut said corners and try to, you know, ad adhere to Apple's pressure for lower prices and at the same time keep up your quality and, and your processes. And I just don't know if it's attainable or tenable in the long term. Yeah. AMD ongoing battle. Let's talk about AMD. They have, you know, right. they're around. They got stuff. Uh, they introduced three new Radeon RX 6000 series graphics cards that compete with NVIDIA's RTX 3000 series. About to get my hands on one of those soon, so we'll see if the hype is all there or not. All three new 6000 series cards are based on RDNA 2, 
also used in the PS5 and Xbox Series X. If any of that sounds familiar, that's why. They support hardware accelerated ray tracing and use a 2.5 uh, slot design with regular PCIe connections. They all come up with 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory, but use high speed 128 megabyte cache TP feeds data, uh, sorry, excuse me, to feed data into the graphics pipeline rather uh, or better without increasing power draw. The RTX uh, RX 6800 is $579. The 6800 XT is $649. And both of these go on sale on November 19th. The 6900 XT is $999. And uh, that cool price will come to you on December 8th. So competitively priced with NVIDIA's current offerings and in theory, performance-wise as well. So um, I've said from the get-go of <laughs> the voodoo days, it was really important that graphics uh, card suppliers or graphics card innovators have competition in this market. And you could argue that NVIDIA has gotten a lot of spotlight lately, but AMD's always been strong with deals with console makers and other device makers. This puts them hopefully you know, in parity with the PC side. Uh, it's going to heat up for, for desktop graphics processing moving forward. What's what's interesting is that uh, ray tracing as a feature is now a tick box that you need to have on your product. Before, like when it was first introduced by Nvidia, everyone was like, "Well, I mean, what are you going to really see over uh, what traditional uh, um, shading offered you?" Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently, enough for in, uh, AMD to crank out cards as well as GPUs for for the PS5 and the uh, and the uh, uh, Xbox One. Series X uh, sure. for their machines. I don't know. It's it's really exciting. At the same time, it's also kind of unnerving to see that the and granted these are these aren't mid range cards, but like you know you're starting around 500, 580 bucks. Mm -hmm. Although what's interesting is Nvidia is actually cheaper with the RTX yeah. 3070 at 500 versus the RX 6800, which it's paired against at uh, which comes in at 580. But the rest the, the uh, Radeon comes in uh, a bit cheap, uh, noticeably cheaper. Yeah, a little bit more parity there. The other thing, too, to just mention about this is the to your race tracing uh, comment. That's a really important pivot for all of these companies right now. And it kind of came out of nowhere or came very quickly, I'll say it that way, because people have been trying to figure out real-time ray tracing, which basically is just rendering light physics, for those not aware, uh, forever. We've been doing this forever. It used to take a day to render a single frame of a ray trace single image, and now we're doing it in real time. And even games like, I'm playing World of Warcraft right now on a 2080 NVIDIA that is running ray tracing on a 15-year-old game. So it's actually a technology that, in theory, will affect lots and lots of games, not just new ones, but those who are still around or playing as services. Fortnite's a good example. They're adding ray tracing capability. It'll be there for their console release and so on for these new consoles. So it is really, truly a tick box now. You're right. And it will become a standard moving forward. And we will just one day look back and say, well, that's just video game lighting and and that's when it changed and, and that's just how we get lighting in video games now and it's a big thing like it's a huge thing for a lot of people it seems like i already have video games with cool lighting but this is a big step and and what's interesting for amd is they're trying to fight two fronts right they're trying to fight on the cpu front but also the gpu front and they're with different companies it's not like you know you're going at it for gpu market share with intel or cpu market share with nvidia right. so uh they they are they they're in a very robust position right now that they can work on both fronts equally competently at this point. Yeah, yeah it's really interesting. Oh, you mentioned the uh, the price point on the sixty eight hundred. Uh, AMD is saying you want to compare that to the twenty eighty Ti, not to the thirty seventy. Uh, and I don't know if that's because the thirty seventy goes on sale later this week, uh, and they want to direct your attention away or for it, from it, or if it just uh, matches up better against the 2080 Ti. Uh, but AMD is doing an interesting thing here, betting on uh, cash, betting on performance to say, look, no, you can get more uh, GDDR6 memory out of an NVIDIA card at the high end, sure, uh, but ours is managed better. Ours is beating it in the specs. Uh, and, you know, that's that's a typical maneuver there we'll we'll see if it bears out with independent tests and all that but uh it's an interesting way to say like we're going to draw less power we're going to be more efficient even if we don't have all the same specs hey folks if you want to join the conversation in our discord uh do that you can talk about all kinds of things in there a link to a patreon account and join at patreon.com slash dtns <laughs> 
Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, Alphabet slash Google CEO Sundar Pichai, and Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey testified before a U.S. subcommittee about the way they use Section 230, or Safe Harbor. Section 230 of the CDA in the United States provides that, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Uh, all that means is if I'm hosting an AOL chat room at AOL, AOL is not responsible for what the folks in there say. AOL is the publisher, is not the publisher or the speaker, the, the chatters are. And that now applies to Facebook and Twitter. It also protects the companies from civil liability for actions, quote, taken in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider, Facebook or Twitter, considers to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. Uh, this is important. This says they can remove stuff that isn't illegal, uh, and they're not uh, subject to civil liability for doing so. That's one of the main things that's at issue here. Keep in mind that otherwise objectionable category when we get to this later on. Now, Section 230 does not exempt them from criminal law. Uh, that's in the in, in the law. Does not exempt them from intellectual property law. So DMCA takedowns uh, don't get a Section 230 exemption. Uh, does not exempt them from state laws where applicable, electronic communication privacy law, or more recently with the passage of FOSTA, sex trafficking law. A subsequent case to the passage of Section 230 in 1997, Zarin versus AOL, determined that Section 230, quote, creates a federal immunity to any cause of action that would make service providers liable for information originating with a third-party user of the service. So originally, Section 230 was building on case law that said, if you don't know something's illegal, let's say you're a bookstore owner, you shouldn't be liable for what's in every book. But if you know it's illegal, well, then you're on the hook. This federal immunity to any cause of action took them off the hook for a lot more things. Now, a lot leans on the wording that shields them from liability for taking down otherwise objectionable content. West Virginia Senator Shelley Moore Capito, uh, during the hearings, asked all three CEOs how they define otherwise objectionable content. That's what they're getting at is like, do you consider conservative opinions objectionable content? Of course, none of them said that. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg noted that the phrase gives them latitude to stop bullying and harassment. And getting rid of that phrase might limit the ability to fight bullying. Sundar Pichai agreed uh, and said, yes, that phrase gives us the flexibility to fight bad stuff. Senator Roger Wicker who chairs the committee, said it was important to shield companies from liability without giving them the ability to censor content they dislike. So he was one of the few people saying, Section 230 shouldn't be repealed, uh, but we should curb the ability for these platforms to say, well, I don't agree with these folks, so let me moderate them down. Uh, and those are the two issues that people with 230 have. First issue is, Companies are too slow to take down harmful content, things like Holocaust denial, for instance. That is content that is not necessarily illegal under the First Amendment here in the United States, but that's stuff that people would rather they didn't have up there, and they're too slow to take it down. Uh, and there's also people accusing them of being too slow to take down illegal content, like child pornography. Number two, removing content based on its viewpoint. That is usually conservative users being censored. Before Section 230, internet companies had two options. You could either leave everything up so you're not liable. In other words, they could say, like, we're not going to moderate anything. It will be a cesspool, not our problem, because uh, if we moderate anything, we're liable. Or they could heavily moderate and say, okay, fine, we're going to keep it from being a cesspool. But since moderation causes us to be liable, uh, we're going to enact prior restraint. Not, you, know, you can't publish anything until we approve it which would, of course, lead to a lot more censorship. So Section 230 says, well, if we, it, it, we don't want a cesspool where people are doing Holocaust denial and child, child pornography, So, uh, but we also don't want full censorship where every platform is only allowing through the things that they're sure are safe. So Section 230 actually provided a safe space for both of these objections to be lessened. Uh, which is why I'm glad Senator Roger Wicker said, well, we don't want to get rid of Section 230. That would make it worse. Uh, maybe we should consider new 
laws or new exemptions or new emphasis in Section 230. Uh, during testimony to Congress, Twitter's CEO Jack Dorsey described his own three-point plan that could be expansions to Section 230, could be brand new legislation altogether, uh, or or if he's willing to do uh, industry self-regulation, like, like movie ratings, for instance. Uh, point one of his three-point plan was to make clear what the moderation process is so everybody can see if it's being followed. Twitter already does this. Facebook already does this. Uh, here are our rules. Now you can hold us accountable to our rules. Number two would require an appeals process, so individuals could get redress if the process is not followed correctly. Uh, Facebook is creating this with their so-called independent Supreme Court. Twitter doesn't really have anything, but they, I guess they're willing to set something up. And number three would be let users have a choice of filter algorithms based on their preference. If you don't want, you know, if you want, I, I want to see everything unless it's illegal, you could choose that algorithm. Or, you know what, I don't want to see hate speech. I, I don't, even if it's legal, I don't want to see this kind of stuff. You could choose that algorithm. There could be flavors of filtering that you decide rather than having the company decide. At least that's his suggestion. Uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg also supported an update to the law, specifically ideas around transparency and industry collaboration. Zuckerberg repeated his call for the government to regulate harmful content, privacy, elections, and data portability. Uh, a lot of people are accusing Zuckerberg, now that he's successful uh, and has, has rose to success on no regulation, he would like regulation to stop competitors from being able to catch him. Uh, <laughs> this is not just the United States either. We should note the European Union's Executive Commission is drafting a new Digital Services Act, and part of that act would address liability for harmful or illegal content. Uh, Competition Commissioner Marguerite Vestager is due to unveil her proposals on December 2nd. This is a so, really tough one. Uh, yeah. And Sc Scott, go ahead if you got got some money. Well, mind. I just something just occurred to me, and I'll just get it off my chest. The the three point approach that say um, Jack has here from Twitter, I know that that's probably too simple, but I really like it. Like I I like to think that everything could be improved under those three ideas. And maybe it, it can, with adjustments to the law to account for whatever, and then building the tools needed to fulfill those three points. Like, maybe that's as simple as that. But to me, that's that says everything. And I don't even uh, agree with Jack Dorsey half the time, but I, I really like that particular approach um, more than I liked anything else coming out of those other guys today. So just, to, just, just off the cuff thought about the three point Twitter approach. Yeah. The filtering like algorithms point, you know, which was one of those points uh, that came from Jack Dorsey. Yeah. Initially I was like, yeah, that would actually, that would make a lot of sense. If there's stuff that, you know, it's protected by free speech or not technically illegal, but really upsets me and I don't want to see it, you know, I can kind of make my experience my own, but we have a lot of those tools already. And that does sort of defeat the purpose of the, point of the social network as it stands today. Twitter and Facebook are always the examples that we use as the most obvious ones, but there are others. And yeah, it's it's kind of, I, I can see where the people in charge of these companies are like, okay, we've got some options. We definitely have some options here, but you know, it's going to radically change the entire, you know, vibe of this whole thing that we've built over time. And there is a very fine line between something that is wrong and should not happen and something that just someone else doesn't like. And yeah. I mean, I see a lot of that, you know, all the time where I'm like, well, I mean, they're allowed to say that, but it's just crappy. Yeah. You know, in my Plus opinion. it starts, it's when you start thinking about the actual content, we really get stuck in the weeds. One of the senators brought up a story. Somebody had made up whole cloth about him beating a dog to death, uh, mm. words to that effect. And basically saying to Zuckerberg, what are you going to do about that when somebody posts some fake thing about me beating up a dog? And it occurred to me, I'm like, I, we're such bad stewards of our, our corner of these social networks that there you have to be generalized, right? How else are you going to have a net broad enough to catch every little problem when the problems are so so granular and so many? Like, how are you going to stop it? How are you going to stop the story about the dog? I don't know how you do that. Well, I, to put a button on this conversation, uh, I, I think what we're running up against is the problem is actually anti-competitive. Uh, if you have 30 Facebooks and 20 Twitters, uh, you don't have the objections because it's like, well, okay, they're allowed to tilt their viewpoint to whatever direction they want because there's all these others you can go to. 
Uh, and misinformation is hard to spread when you have so many different platforms and people are not all using the same one. The problem is everybody's using the same couple uh, in this case and mostly yeah. using one one or two of them. Yeah, I, it, it's going to be interesting before it isn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, like, this is never going to probably be a thing that's totally solved. It will evolve over time. Scott, this might also be interesting, but in a good way to you. Uh, Alphabet says that one of its loon balloons spent 312 days aloft, well above its previously stratospheric flight record of 223 days. It launched in Puerto Rico. It went to Peru. It passed over the South Atlantic, Indian, and South Pacific Oceans and was eventually collected in Baja, Mexico, 10 months and 135,000 miles later. Wow. That's pretty I know. Crazy. Yeah. Good, good work, Loon. Yeah, yeah this, is a, this is a good test flight because what they want is these loons to be able to just go all the way around the Earth uh, and, and sort of spell each other, right? So if, if you're trying to provide connectivity uh, in Baja, uh, it wouldn't be the same balloon providing you the connectivity all the time, but there'd always be a few balloons over Baja, and that's because they would just keep circulating around the Earth. But to do that, of course, uh, you need to have a, be able to make it all the way uh, around the Earth. So this is this is good progress towards that goal. Is it bad for me to assume that when they're done with one of these, they shoot it out of the sky and it crashes into somebody's shed, and that's just the end of it? Because I like that idea in my head. Only in that my head. That will though. only happen over Roswell, and it will be misinterpreted. Ah, man. All right, fine. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you can crash your balloon into my property. That'd be kind of fun. <laughs> They're a little high to shoot with your with your own <laughs> rifle, too. That's that's another point. Uh, hey, let's let's look at the mailbag. Anything in the mailbag there, Sarah? Oh, Tom, indeed there is. Uh, Alan, who actually wrote us on Patreon, said, referring to Good Day Internet 3895, the pre-show, I've been using TechCo, the T-Major series cases for years, and I just bought another one for my iPhone 12. This was yesterday's show. If you were listening, we were talking about cases, and Tom was saying, I kind of want a case, and, you know, do you case or do you not case? Alan says... These are so cheap. This one was $7.85 on Amazon, and I like the two-part installation. I think it's easier on the phone when going on. Well, oh, thank you, Alan. Uh, I, I ordered a different case, and now I can't remember which one it is, uh, but I ordered something that had some ballistic protection uh, so that if I drop it, it's much less likely uh, Or if to crack, a missile hits it. Even with the ceramic shield. <laughs> yep, yep. Don't want any missiles taking out my phone. You That's gotta right. just be careful, you know. Thing. Yeah, it's precious yeah. cargo, man. You know, you can't uh, be too careful. But thank you for the suggestion, Alan. Appreciate that. Yeah, very much so. Also, thank you to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels. We'd like to shout out a few of you today. Chris Allen, Mike Akins, and High Tech Oki. Thank you so much. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us. Scott, what's been going on since we saw you last? Well, lots of stuff. Uh, billions of things to look at and do over there at frogpants.com. But I still want people to go grab the season that we just did of Current Geek Chronicles. All of it's there. It's available at currentgeek.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Imagine me and Tom blowing your minds. That's the show. Go check it out. Currentgeek.com. Like a loon balloon uh, around the podcasting planet. Yeah. Uh, hey, patrons, uh, did you know your ad-free RSS feed can have just DTNS or just GDI or possibly at certain tiers both? Uh, check your tier on Patreon. You go to patreon.com slash pledges. Uh, that'll tell you what tier you're on. If it says DTNS, GDI, or all... That, that tells you what is in your RSS feed. And if you want to change it, just change your tier to one that has what you want in it. Uh, that's all at dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. We are live, folks, Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. We'd love to have you. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>